Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we will take up the news articles from the Hindu of Delhi edition and discuss them as per the demands of UPSC civil services exam. The topics for today's discussion are listed on your screen. Let us begin our discussion. Before moving on to the discussion, we have one important announcement for you. The prelims compass magazines for 2023 are available on our Telegram channel. The link for the same is being provided in the description box. You can go through the magazines which will improve your which will improve your understanding regarding the basic topics and the current events which will help you in your prelims exam which is going to be conducted on 28th May 2023. The first article of today's discussion is based on these two news which has appeared on page number 5 and page number 8 of the hindu respectively these two news articles particularly talks about the issues associated with caste system in india and it has also said that india has become more casteist now than ever before further the political parties are using the name of dr bhim rao ambedkar to gain dalit votes but are not following his teachings the context of this news is directly related to our general studies paper 1 in which the keyword society is mentioned and caste system is one of the salient features of indian society so this area becomes important for our discussion and in today's session we will analyze different dimensions of caste in india the structure of our discussion today will be first of all we will discuss what is caste and what are its basic features then we will see what are the changes witnessed in caste system further why the caste system is still continuing in india then we will see how urbanization and caste are related to each other and finally we will conclude with a case study which you can use to enrich your mains answer now before moving on to the discussion let us have a look at this particular slide in which you can see three questions the first one is saying caste system is assuming new identities and associational forms it was asked in 2018 and in 2020 UPSC again asks a question on caste and it says has caste lost its relevance in understanding the multicultural indian society further in 2022 it asked analyze the salience of sect in indian society vis-a-vis caste region and religion from this particular slide you must have got an idea that it is a very important topic as far as our UPSC mains exam is concerned specifically general studies paper 1 now let us try to understand what the caste is This term caste appears in every day's newspapers and articles so you should have a clear understanding what the caste is and what are its basic features caste is a system of social stratification which is based on the principles of purity and pollution and in this system groups are hierarchically arranged where membership is ascriptive contact is restricted and mobility is theoretically impossible now what does this ascriptive means it means that caste is determined by birth and it is not a matter of choice further it is an institution which is unique to indian subcontinent and traditionally it was characteristic of hindu society but gradually spread to major non hindu communities like muslims sikhs and christians so that was the basic understanding regarding caste whenever you come across a question you can start your answer with this particular information which can build a strong introductory start to your answer now we will see the basic features of caste system the first one is ascriptive as we have discussed in previous slide ascriptive means once caste will be decided by birth and it is not a matter of choice the second one is endogamous now it is related to the rules about marriage and in most of the cases the marriages are restricted to the members of the caste group the next one is commonality it is related to the rules about food and food sharing for example what kind of food to be eaten and with whom the food can be shared it is an important feature of caste system the next one is hierarchy the caste system involves arrangement of groups in hierarchy of rank and status for example in indian society majorly this hierarchy is followed among different communities at the top is brahmans then kshatriyas then vaishyas and at the last shudras the next one is caste based occupations many occupations are traditionally linked to the caste groups for example manual scavenging is mostly done by dalits who are at the lower rungs of caste hierarchy the last one is segmental organization it means the caste involves sub divisions within themselves and they are known as sub castes for example there are many castes 
in OBCs, SCs and STs. So this particular feature is related to subcasts. So here we have discussed the six features associated with caste system. Now we will see the changes in the caste system. Traditionally, the nature of caste system has undergone significant changes in modern day society. And many features of caste system have been diluted to some extent due to new developments like the first one is modern education. It instills rationality, justice and equality among common people, which further reduces the impact of caste system on Indian society. The next one is industrialization. Industrialization gave equal opportunity to all the individuals across different castes and it further destroyed the tradition of caste based occupation in Indian industries. The next one is urbanization. It gives anonymity to the caste identity of individuals and commensality rules are no more strictly adhered in the urban areas. For example, at food joints or restaurants. The next one is land reforms. These reforms were undertaken by government of India after independence and has resulted in the transfer of land from upper caste to lower castes. This resulted in the economic empowerment and improved status of lower caste groups. The next one is universal adult franchise. It was provided by the constitution of India to all the people who are above 18 years of age and it resulted into political participation across different caste groups. The next one is 73rd and 74th Constitution Amendment Act. These acts gave political power to the lower castes and increased their representation in the decision making bodies like panchayats and municipalities. Further, constitutional rights under Article 14, 15 and 16 are provided to all the citizens irrespective of the caste, religion or region. The last one is affirmative action. In simple terms, it is related to the reservation policy which is followed by government of India to provide an additional support to the people from lower castes who are educationally and economically backward. And it further helps in mobility of lower caste people who are mostly stuck in the lower rungs of society. Despite these developments, caste continues to play a significant role in Indian society. Now why this continuity of caste system exists? The first one is related to political mobilization. Many of you must be aware that there are multiple caste based organizations work towards mobilization of people and rendered the caste based identity relevant for Indian society. Example of one such organization is Bahujan Samaj Party of Uttar Pradesh. The next one is manual scavenging. It is about cleaning and carrying the human excreta by individuals and mostly restricted to the lower caste groups. The next one is shift from public to private space. Now what does this mean? It means that generally people avoid to follow the rituals related to caste system in their public spaces but they practice them in their personal spaces. The ritual aspect of caste system continued but confined to the personal sphere. The next one is informal sector. According to a study by Oxfam, Dalits and tribal groups are highly underrepresented in better paid and higher status jobs and they are disproportionately concentrated in the informal sector. It highlights the continuity of caste system in India. The next one is honor killing. It is related to the marriage between upper caste and lower caste people. We have seen many instances of honor killing in which parents kill their children if they get to marry a person from a lower caste. It again highlights that the caste system is still prevalent in India and it continues to play an important role in the lives of people. Further, the NCRB report of 2020 has said that Crimes against SCST has increased in 2020 as compared to 2019. And in last year, a 9 year old Dalit boy was assaulted by a school teacher for touching the vessel to drink water which was kept for teacher and that boy later died. Such instances are still impacting the lives of Indians in 21st century. You can quote this report and this example while writing your answer on caste system. Now we will analyze how urbanization and caste system are related to each other and whether the urbanization has reduced the impact of caste system in India or not. The process of urbanization, if carried out in a planned and sustainable manner, it can potentially help India to mitigate the impact of all pervasive caste system. The first point here is anonymity. Urbanization provides relative anonymity to individual's identity which makes it difficult for the rules of purity and pollution to be observed. The next one is jobs on merit. In urban areas, jobs are distributed based on expertise, ability and merit 
and not decided on caste the next one is inter caste marriages the inter caste marriages based on individual choices rather than parents choice are prevalent in urban areas the next one is government jobs and education due to the reservation policy the people from backward castes got entry to government jobs and educational institutions which helps in providing mobility to lower caste groups and the last one is dating apps with digital revolution the online matrimonial websites and dating apps are moving away from the old practice of mentioning caste so we have discussed how urbanization and caste are related to each other and how the urban lifestyle helps in mitigating the impact of caste system on indian society further to conclude your answer you can also mention article 21 which provides liberty privacy and dignity to every individual irrespective of caste religion region or race you can also mention a case study of tamil nadu's village which is named as equality village where all castes religions can live side by side and the objective of the village is to ensure that people from all castes religions live together share civic amenities services without any discrimination or differential treatment as the sabri mala judgment says the social values and morals have their space but they are not above the constitutionally guaranteed freedom which is provided to every individual irrespective of their gender or caste and at last constitutional morality prevails over social morality by using these points you can conclude your answer on the caste system after discussing the caste system in detail i hope that you will be able to write these three questions which appeared in upsc mains exam the quick recap of our discussion firstly we have discussed the context of the news its relevance for the upsc mains exam we have also seen that upsc repeatedly asked questions on caste system we have discussed what caste is the basic features of caste the changes in caste system why the caste system is continuing in india urbanization and caste and a conclusion with sabri mala judgment the next article of today's discussion is based on this news which has appeared on page number 13 in the hindu the context of this news is that the prime minister of india addressed the national rozgar mela on thursday and he highlighted the success of mudra scheme which has created 8 crore new entrepreneurs and he emphasized the power of microfinance in energizing the economy at grassroots level this news article is related to general studies paper 3 which has a section of economic development microfinance is a strategy microfinance is a strategy which plays an important role in inclusive growth of country so this area becomes important for our discussion and in 2016 upsc has directly asked a question on pradhan mantri mudra yojana the answer to this question is a as the focus of this particular scheme is to bring the small entrepreneurs into formal financial system further in the same year upsc asked about pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana which will help in financial inclusion of the poor section of indian society it is also related to inclusive growth these questions highlights the relevance of this particular topic which is related to microfinance and in today's discussion we will see what is the importance of microfinance in india what are the objectives of microfinance and we'll also go through the scheme which is known as pradhan mantri mudra yojana in detail which can also help you in your prelims exam now what is the importance of microfinance in india the first one is it works as a anti poverty vaccine mostly poor people who are residing in rural areas are deprived of schemes extended by state or center governments so with the help of microfinance these people can get credit which can help them in sustaining their livelihood the second one is asset creation and income security microfinance aims at assisting communities to achieve a greater level of asset creation at household or community level so that they can be made a part of larger economic system the next one is women empowerment the loans which women will get from microfinance facilities will help them in starting their businesses which will make them independent and which will further result into empowerment of women microfinance plays an important role in women empowerment the last one is credit for small entrepreneurs now credit is important to poor people for maintaining the balance between their income and expenditure and it also plays an important role in income generating activities like investing in marginal farms and other small scale ventures which will further contribute in enhancing the quality of life of poor people these were the four major important aspects associated with microfinance 
Now we will see what are the objectives of microfinance in India. It basically deals with the idea behind this particular mechanism of microfinance which government has extended to help the poor people. The first objective is formalization of small businesses. Now when the capital will be provided to businesses, their operations will expand and they will hire more labor and becomes a part of formal economic system. So it helps in formalization of small businesses. The second one is digital banking. The microfinance is extended through banks and Pradhan Mantri Jan Dhan Yojana plays an important role in that. Specifically in rural areas, the small help groups can get the benefits from digital banking to access the credit facilities which can help them in generating income through multiple activities like it is happening in Himachal Pradesh, Gujarat and Odisha. Many women self-help groups have been constituted there and they are working on different activities for their livelihood. For example, in Himachal Pradesh, many women SHGs are being working to create plates and cups made out of leaves. So in this way, the digital banking is also being promoted through microfinance. The next one is equitable growth. As the microfinance activities are mostly concentrated on the underserved states, so it will help in bridging up the regional imbalance which was created due to the poor implementation of state policies. And the last one is skill development. It is also an important objective of microfinance. When money will be available with people, they will invest in training and upgradation of their skills so that they can earn more and improve their quality of life. Here we have discussed the important objectives of microfinance. Now we will discuss the scheme Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana in detail. It is a scheme which was launched in 2015 for providing loans up to 10 lakh rupees to non-corporate and non-farms small and micro enterprises. Now these loans will be given by the commercial banks which includes the public and private, regional rural banks, small finance banks, microfinance institutions and NBFCs. Now under the aegis of Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, three different interventions have been made to address the funding needs of the beneficiary. The first one is Shishu and it covers the loans up to 50,000 rupees. The second one is Kishore. The second one is Kishore. It covers the loans from 50,000 to 5 lakh. And the third one is Tarun which covers the loans from 5 lakh to 10 lakh. So these were the basic details associated with this particular scheme. Now we will see the objective of Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana. The objective of this scheme is to promote entrepreneurship among the new generation youth. It is also ensured that the more focus will be given to Shishu category units rather than Kishore and Tarun. Now who are the target clients under Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana? These include non-corporate small business segments, shopkeepers, truck operators, machine operators, artisans in rural and urban areas. And what is the eligibility criteria to access loan under this particular scheme? Any Indian citizen who has a business plan for non-farm income generating activity such as manufacturing, processing or trading whose credit need is up to 10 lakh rupees, they can get the loans under this particular scheme. To summarize our discussion, first of all we have discussed the context, its relevance for the mains exam. We have also seen a prelims and mains question of 2016 which was associated with financial inclusion which is directly or indirectly related to microfinance. We have then discussed the importance of microfinance in India, the objectives of microfinance. We had a detailed analysis of Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, its objective, target clients and eligibility. Now we will discuss one case study which is associated with casteism. As we have already discussed in detail about the caste system in India, this article highlights menace of casteism. Through this article, we will try to understand the various ethical issues associated with the practice of caste system. In 2015, UPSC asked a case study on caste system in which cook from Dalit community was employed in the school to prepare the midday meals and many children belonging to higher castes are not allowed to take meals by their parents. It highlights the issue of casteism so today we will try to analyze the ethical issues associated with this. The first one is discrimination and it results into discrimination among the fellow citizens on the basis of birth in particular caste. So it is one of the ethical issue. The next one is social exclusion. Casteism led to the social exclusion of people from the lower castes in day to day activities. The next one is inequality. Discrimination and social exclusion based on caste lead to increasing social and economic inequalities as people from the lower castes are not provided equal opportunities 
in social, political and economic spheres of life. The next one is prejudice. Due to the various beliefs, due to the various beliefs associated with casteism prevents the participation of people from the lower castes in various social activities. For example, entry to temples. The next one is stereotyping. The prejudices based on caste system led to create many stereotypes against people from lower castes such as consumption of non-vegetarian food. The next one is exploitation. Caste system advocates birth-based occupations where lower caste people are being compelled to take inhuman professions such as manual scavenging. The next one is marginalization and segregation. In many places of the country, people from the lower castes are not allowed to live in the vicinity of higher caste groups. It results into marginalization and segregation in the society which further harms the greatest good principle. The next one is oppression. Caste system also validates the oppression of lower castes by upper caste people. And we have seen one incident related to Vandana Kataria. She is a hockey player of Indian women team. And after the loss at Olympics, many people gathered outside the house of Vandana Kataria to slur casteist remarks. You can use such examples to enrich your answers. And the last one is failure of state. The discrimination and exclusion which the people from lower caste faced highlights the failure of state to ensure the well-being of its subjects. So it is also an ethical issue. Here we have discussed nine ethical issues which are associated with casteism. Now we will see what can be a way forward to this particular problem. The first one is strict implementation of SCST Act. It will ensure that, that the people from lower caste are not being oppressed and exploited by other caste groups. The second one is education. Government should focus on educating the people from all the sections of society specifically from lower caste groups so that they can enter the mainstream and live a dignified life. The third one is economic empowerment. Schemes like Stand Up India plays a vital role in the empowerment of people from SCST community and it also helps them in improving the quality of their life. The fourth one is representation. We need to increase the representation of these people in administration and politics so that their concerns are adequately heard and adequate solution can be put forward. The fifth one is role models. We need to create role models like Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar who have contributed a lot to Indian society and India's freedom struggle. And by looking at these role models, people from lower caste groups get adequate confidence to do big things in their life. The sixth one is ethical ecosystem. We need to create an ethical ecosystem in the country so that people from all communities live in harmony and support each other during their hard time. And the last one is value-based education. We need to put emphasis on this particular thing so that value-based education in school and colleges should be imparted which will further increase the ethical quotient of society. By implementing these strategies, we can create a society which will provide equal opportunities to all the people of the country so that they can live a dignified life. As we have discussed the ethical issues and a way forward, now you can attempt this particular question and try to write the answer in 250 words. The next topic for today's discussion is based on these two news which has appeared on page number 8 and 13 respectively. The context is that there is a consistent effort by the opposition parties in India to build unity against the ruling party but they have failed in past two general elections. The topic of role of opposition in Indian democracy holds significant relevance for the UPSC mains exam and it is directly related to the general studies paper too in which it is mentioned that parliament and state legislatures and issues associated with them. Moreover, in the year 2021, UPSC has asked that to what extent Parliament is able to ensure accountability of executive in India, which makes this topic important as UPSC has previously asked many questions related to Parliament and its functioning. Today we will be discussing the role of opposition in Indian democracy and the factors which hinders the growth of robust opposition in India. Now what is the opposition party? It is the party with the second largest strength in Lok Sabha or state legislature. After every general election, the question of formally recognized opposition party and leader of opposition arises and it is being dealt under this particular act which is named as Salary and Allowances of Leader of Opposition in Parliament Act 1977. And this particular act defines the leader of opposition as that the member of house who is the leader in that house of the party in opposition to government having the greatest numerical strength and recognized as such by the chairman of council of state or the speaker of the house of people. 
the condition for recognition of party or group as opposition is that it should have the one tenth of the total members of the house. It is also same as the quorum, which is required for the sitting of the house. The 1977 Act extends the leader of opposition to both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, and it also provided them the status of cabinet minister. But in case of Lok Sabha, it is subject to the speaker's recognition. Here we have discussed what the opposition party is. and details about the leader of opposition now we will analyze the crucial role played by opposition in a democracy the first one is the opposition act as a loyal opposition by holding government accountable for its actions policies and decisions this involves engaging in constructive criticism raising questions and demanding transparency from the ruling party opposition plays a vital role in scrutinizing the government's action and policies to ensure that they are in the best interest of the people and are in line with the democratic norms and principles the second one is opposition serve as watchdog it monitors the performance of government through debates and discussions to bring attention to any shortcomings or failures in government's actions and policies it helps in maintaining transparency integrity and effectiveness in governance the next one is opposition act as representative of diverse voices it provides a platform for marginalized or underrepresented groups to voice their concerns and opinions opposition also presents different ideologies perspectives and provide a forum for deliberation and debate on various issues which are affecting different sections of society it helps in promoting inclusivity and diversity in decision making process the last one is ensuring competitive political environment opposition offers an alternative vision and policy proposals to ruling party and it act as a catalyst for healthy competition which is essential for vibrant and dynamic democracy the opposition also serve as potential alternative government by presenting itself as a credible option to ruling party and providing choices to electorate during elections hence we can see that the role of opposition in indian democracy includes holding government accountable acting as watchdog representing diverse voices promoting competition and offering alternative policy proposals it serve as a crucial check and balance on ruling party and contributing to the functioning and health of democratic system currently we have a weak and fragmented opposition and the former chief justice of india has said that there used to be a mutual respect between government and opposition and unfortunately the space for opposition is now diminishing now we will try to analyze the factors that hinder the growth of robust opposition in indian democracy there are five fundamental problems which hinders the growth of opposition the first one is indian parliamentary system does not give any power to opposition and it keeps the opposition toothless because it cannot pass legislation affect government programs or influence executive officials this makes the members of opposition useless to their constituents and gradually they began to lose the support also the next is our system grants power to parties and not to individual mps it is a major reason for fragmentation of opposition the ambitious opposition leaders are often sidelined by their respective parties and it results into proliferation of local and regional parties which have different agenda and interests the next one is vote bank and extremism to stay relevant and avoid breakups parties begin to represent one special interest for example caste or religion and they inflame the feelings of their constituents make outrageous promises and breed hatred of other groups hence it hinders the growth of opposition in india the next one is indian political system does not provide opposition parties with institutions to hone their skills unlike united kingdom india's opposition is not offered a shadow cabinet so the opposition always lacks an agenda and the last one is submission of opposition by ruling party now how it happens there are multiple government agencies like cbi income tax department which are being used by ruling party against the opposition leaders and it harms their reputation and scares good people away from politics further our system also does not help opposition parties to acquire good leaders or become strong organizations most of the parties stay small and thus remains a one man show now what should be the conclusion opposition parties are essential component of democratic system and they are contributing significantly to the government's overall functioning and accountability therefore it is imperative to support them as they contribute to the growth and development of nation like india in this way you can conclude your answer if a question on role of opposition parties in democracy is being asked to summarize our discussion firstly we have discussed the context its relevance for the general studies paper 2 we have also seen a mains question we discussed what an opposition party is 
leader of opposition the role played by opposition in democracy and the factors which hinders the growth of opposition that's all for today's discussion thank you for watching today's dns stay tuned for upcoming sessions which will give you more perspectives and increase your understanding regarding different topics which are appearing in daily newspapers